thank you all for coming for the, to the last talk for today. Um, yeah, I want to talk about KD Embedded. Uh, what is it? Why are we doing that? And what is coming next? So um, before I am starting into the detail why we are doing it, I think it's important to, to have the scope or the definition what I mean with embedded today, because there, there's an extremely wide range of different things. There are people for which embedded is a really small microprocessor, which, let's uh, say, a few kilobytes of RAM. So that's something that does not make sense for us if we want to run a plus by desktop on it. It simply will not work. So um, in the scope of this talk and during what I'm usually doing, I'm talking about such development boards. So big, well, usually a little bit less big than on this picture, but um, things that are powerful in terms of CPU usually have a GPU also, because without a graphic card, um, it's not that much fun to do everything, uh, every cute, quick rendering with CPU acceleration, especially if the, the CPU is then not that fast, like on a big power horse. Um, that, you could also say uh, it's enterprise embedded. I think that's the best name for that. It's a, well, stra strange combination, but um, think about a Raspberry Pi board, or I think it's Team Deck. It's, uh, well, it's a little bit more powerful, much more powerful than a Raspberry Pi, but so powerful things, but um, with a defined scape, scope or a task. And I think that's the um, um, main de denominator that we are not talking about um, hardware that is used for anything, but you are thinking about a task when you're creating it. And I think that's, that's the main thing. We want to have Linux on it, Plasma on it, we have power, but we have a certain task. And yeah, we have hardware in the wild. And then there is a question, why should I care about it? Why should I ever use that board pay money to, to, to get it and then work on it. And during, during, during preparation of the, of the slides of this talk, I, I thought about it for a couple of time. Uh, why I am doing that? Why I am looking into getting a kernel running on an arbitrary RISC-V board? And I came up with two, two sets of different answers. Um, I think on the one side, it's, um, well, it's a curiosity. You, you, really would like to know what's happening in this board. Uh, what can it do? Is, is it powerful enough? How far is, are the hardware guys at the moment? Um, it's also a little bit of challenge because there, there's this new board. Maybe I could be the first one getting Plasma Stack running. It's, it's cool. And it's also a little bit of adventure because, well, if you have a board and you have a, a Chinese documentation and, well, literally Chinese, and you need an online translator to, to figure out what the Chinese words are meaning. It's, it's, it's funny to, to, to look into it. And then, well, if you finally get to the first time a kernel booting, U boot booting, and you see it in your serial console, and you get a plus, plasma shell, that's really, it's cool. It, it makes fun. And I think that's one, one reason why people are looking into that. Um, another reason is, um, I think it's more coming from, um, you have an idea, you have a project. You, you think about, I would like to have a weather station at home. And then you are looking for hardware, and you are looking for uh, software. You are getting both together, and then you are also coming to that area because you don't want to put it onto a big desktop computer in the corner of your living room. You want to have a nice, nice tiny system. And I think th these are the both key motivations for people looking into that, and that's what you should keep in mind when we are talking about um, why we are doing that. And after thinking about that, uh, I asked my, myself, what are the goals of what we did during the last years in um, KDE Embedded or the whole embedded area with people working in KDE? And mostly looking into retrospective what we did. I think um, there were two goals we wanted to achieve. Um, and one goal is for sure to get um, a bigger user base or an bigger footprint of the KDE frameworks in the industry. Because um, the first things that were done here there are definitely the uh, creation of Yocto layers for um, the KDE frameworks to get it easy to be used in industry, like, like automotive. It's, I think the, the key area we want to get our 
food into the door. Um, and I think that uh, also worked quite well. And another thing, or another goal um, that I saw the, were that we had, um, yeah, that we entered in areas at um, conferences we ha haven't been before, and we um, try to get, well, get new people attracted to, to what we are doing in KDE. People outside of the typical desktop environment, so the, the environment about the best desktop environment, um, that are used more to embedded topics to say, well, we are also not that far from you. And so the demo things um, about getting a Plasma mobile demo setup or Plasma big screen setup, I think that are also, it's the second big goal from uh, looking um, in the past years. Um, before talking about what is happening or what other things for the future, um, I think I have to do, start with one slide about uh, Yocto, what Yocto is meaning. Um, short count, who did ever work with Yocto in this, that room? Okay, who liked it? <laughs> okay. Um, for everybody who never used Yocto, um, it can be explained easily by saying um, it's a big collection of um, instructions how to create packages. You can think about Flatpak or Snap or Docker instructions that explains uh, how a certain software project is checked out, configured, built, and installed. The second big part is um, the BitBake. The BitBake is uh, the main com meter compile system there, and that's essentially a, a task, task tool. It gets tens of thousands of tasks, brings them in order, and does all of them. And that's, that's the whole purpose of, of it. You tell it what you want to have, and you usually tell it by um, creating a small configuration file. Think about a Docker file, for example, uh, where you explain uh, what you want to have as a result. So you want to have a system image for your specific board, for your Raspberry Pi 4 board, for example, and you want to have Plasma there, and Kate, and whatever. You list it down in a certain format, and you tell a Bitbake, and Bitbake looks into all the recipes and sees, okay, for Plasma, I have to compile Qt, and so on. And all these things are brought into an order, and then uh, source code is fetched, source code is configured, it's compiled, it's packaged, and at the end, a certain format of the um, target image is built that you can put onto the device. And People in the industry like Yocto for a um, few reasons what it does additionally to, additional to, uh, to that image. Because you also get um, the S-bombs, so the software bill of material, which is super important in the industry right now, because you want to know exactly which software do you have in your system because of um, security usually, also about legal issues, licenses. So um, that is coming for free. Um, you are able to creating cross-building SDKs because let's say you are building for risk 5 and you are on an x86 system, so you have to cross-compile from one system to the other. And you don't want every developer using a little bit complicated tool like Yocto, but you want them an easy workflow, have an SDK, just install it, configure it with your IDE, and cross-compile. And that's also there. And I think one of the biggest selling points, maybe also the biggest pains of Yocto is um, it's, it's a distribution builder with the inherent goal to um, be always able to create everything from scratch. So that's, that's really cool because um, if you think about Debian, Fedora, SUSE, how often are they cleaning all packages and building everything thing again? Um, here it's the basic idea of the build tool that you can clean everything, and you have a defined state and a defined way how to get to a target image. And that's really useful in the industry, and it brings you flexibility. And it brings you also flexibility in terms of um, doing certain adaptations to um, big changes, like going to new hardware, because you're building everything by hand, or everything from, from ground on, so you can easily port to completely different hardware, make major changes in the libraries, and so on. And that's the tooling. And in KDE, we are involved in a few areas. And um, these areas uh, are the, the layers. Um, layers are simple organizations of these 
packaging information. So the, in Bitbag uh, slang, it's called recipes. So we uh, provide several layers nowadays. Uh, we are providing a meter K5. I think that's the most used layer outside in the industry. It simply packages all of KD, KD Frameworks 5. We have also a staging layer of um, uh, KF6, which um, gets semi-regular updates of the Git latest hashes tested, that it works, it's staging ground, but um, it's already there to, to find breakage um, quite early during the uh, KF6 development. We have uh, Meta KDE, which is a layer for um, packaging all of Plasma, because we need it for our demo setup that we have a Plasma mobile desktop or Plasma big screen or even Plasma desktop, an ordinary one. Um, and then we have apps. And I did a rough calculation. We have about 6% of KDE package. It's what we used during demos at the moment. Um, however, I think that the number will extremely increase uh, in short term because somebody uh, reached out to us that uh, who already packaged nearly all everything of KDE and we will also get that integrated, which is quite cool for, for demoing. Um, then, what, what is the hardware we are usually looking at? Because I talked about enterprise embedded, so what's, what idea, uh, do I mean uh, specifically? Um, and on this slide, I did a collection of the main boards um, I or others are, are using for that. Uh, on the top left, I think that's the classic board uh, everybody knows, um, and most of us probably have some version if it's a Raspberry Pi 2, 3, or 4. Um, I really prefer the, the 4 version because of the graphics driver, which finally gets an open source driver, and everything is more nice with the Mesa stack on below it. But um, there we have um, recipes 4. We had, did demos on it. Uh, Volker did several demos on it. Um, I think on the 3 version. Um, then on the top right, it's a really cool board. It's um, it was just released uh, during around last Christmas. Um, it's a Vision 5.2 board by uh, Star 5, a Chinese company. Um, and that's the first Risk 5 board with an onboard GPU. And that's the cool thing about it. I tried previously uh, getting Plasma 1 on a Risk 5 system without a GPU, and a turning rectangle, I got turning with two frames per second. It's, um, yeah. You need a lot of CPU if you don't want to do software rendering, and with that, it's, it's easy. It's uh, look really decent. Um, and at the bottom left, um, I just edited the, the slides. I added the uh, Beagle Play because I think it's an extremely cool hardware to play around, um, and it should be easy to get our stuff onto it. I already have one at home. Um, and at uh, Wednesday, there was just the official announcement by the um, Beagle Foundation that they have the Beagle 5 uh, ahead, which is um, another Risk 5 board with an onboard GPU. Really cool one. Um, um, and uh, both of them, Risk um, Vision 5.2 and uh, the Beagle 5, uh, have uh, imagination GPUs, so these power we are. But I'm hopeful that the uh, Beagle 5 earlier we'll get an open source driver, but we will see. And maybe if more devices. But um, the question um, for me is um, which devices should we focus on? I think that's something I would likely uh, gladly discuss in the both, or if you have ideas, uh, talk to me. Because I think um, for us as a community, it makes sense to have one, two, three, at most devices where we say, that makes sense. We try to to test everything on it and make it easy for people to get on it. Um, so, what did we do during the last years? Um, we did really cool stuff um, from after the beginning. Um, looking back, I looked for the first commit in Meta K5, which was Johan Tellin. I think he did it uh, during his day job at that time, which is cool, contribution from, well, officially coming from the KDE people, and not that far, but he did it um, because he needed it for, um, for, uh, for work uh, in his company. Um, we discovered it later and above uh, here at Academy, I think 2018, 19, one of those, um, and revived it, and Volker took over and um, did a lot of updating. 
Um, we have been at the um, uh, Embedded Linux Conference Europe, which is the, that main conference for um, talking to people about embedded stuff for Yocto stuff. And I think that was well perceived. We had a booth there. Um, then, and probably a lot of me people missed that, but already at FOSDEM 2019, uh, we had a RISC V board at our stall at FOSDEM with an external GPU, but Plasma was running, and that was uh, extremely early to that time. Also, the contributions to get it running were also outside of the KDE community. So it shows a little bit that there's interest for that. And this first time we had um, a demo with uh, the Vision 5.2 board, and the perception was also quite, quite good. Uh, a lot of people asked. And I think a lot of people not traditionally coming from desktop systems. Um, but the remainder of the, this talk, um, I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about where to go next in the one, two, or three years. And I try to, to group that a little bit between what do, do we want to have, what do we sell, our product. Um, at the top left, it's a, fr uh, it's a picture of French fries from my favorite French fries shop in Brussels, where we were going for 13 years every first time because they sell French fries. They have potatoes and they make fries. And after some years, they have they extended um, the sauces. Now they have also a few candles and burgers, but everybody is coming for the fries. There is extremely long, long queue. And the main product is so clear, fried potatoes. And it's selling. And the other is not, thing is nice, but they have a clear focus. And I think that's important for a product. Um, second is, where is the la hardware landscape going? What are the trends? And, and third, about people, how should we make it easier for people uh, looking more into embedded stuff in KDE? Starting with the products. Um, as already said, um, I think Meta KF5 is, or Meta KF, KF star, because 6 is already on the horizon, is what we should focus on, we, are, we focus on, we, are, we co should continue on, because it's used. And I already got requests from people who wanted to, uh, to port to KF6, actually, probably the, because they are using Qt6, and it's not easy um, in Yocto uh, due to the uh, meta Qt layer to, well, you have, had to have to do a hard porting, or you have to do a lot of hacks. Um, so uh, there are people already looking forward for, for newer versions, and I think that's, that will be also in the foreseeable future our main selling factor. But aside from that, um, I think the um, demoing part is extremely important because it helps us for outreaching to, uh, to newer people. Especially, um, we don't get regular, sometimes, contributions by people outside of the KDE community who simply look into Yocto, have a board, want to try it out, and see, oh, there's something working, or I want to update that version. And that's, that's nice, because we get people in areas we didn't think about yet. Um, as another selling factor for what we are doing, um, it's a little bit harder to explain, but um, think about a company who is um, not really deep into uh, software platforms. And it's usually, it's, companies are often locked to, to certain hardware, have a certain product, and then they decide, let's do a new hardware. And the software departments also get the, uh, the hint, yeah, we want to port. And often that software is not flexible enough. And you have the problem, you want to order new hardware, but you have no idea how good that hardware is. The vendor will say it's awesome, but you want to test it out. And that's um, an area where we actually can help, or our, our stack can help, because um, getting Plasma and applications running on a board, it's um, a good, really good benchmark of what the hardware vendor did. Because um, we are using quite a lot of, of different functionality, network, valent, GPU. So you can test a lot by simply getting our software running. And it's not because we have a big footprint, but because we are using up-to-date interfaces and standard software. And that's a really good, good benchmark to, to see if the vendor is doing a proper job before investing a lot of time for, uh, for porting. And a fourth point, 
I put on the next slide because that's what I'm currently uh, looking about or really would like to, uh, to work on because I was really fascinated by David's talk last year. I directly ordered a Steam Deck and only for that single option. Yes, I also started playing after 20 years without playing, but um, I really much like the idea about uh, switching from desktop mode, uh, from Steam mode to desktop mode. I think it's an extremely cool feature if you look at into a little bit broader scheme. Uh, let's say you create a weather station for at home and you want to debug it. Usually you have your computer, connect to it, and you have the serial console maybe or Ethernet if you set it up. Wouldn't it be so nice if you have a nice way simply pull into our Yocto layer and that get, do some magic command, tell system control, switch to desktop. And you have it, plug in your, uh, your, um, your uh, keyboard and you can work on it. And I think that's very easy to achieve and I think that could be a quite general solution. It's, um, that is actually my next big project for this year, aside from the boards I have. But um, I think that's, that could be another nice selling point. Um, here it's only idea. Give me, I'm glad, glad about any feedback about that. Okay, that's about products. Next about um, hardware landscape. Um, where are we at the moment? Um, if you look deeply at the devices I showed, um, there was only one ARM device. I had or only two, two ARM devices, two, two S5 devices. Um, and I think that's um, currently a major, major shift there. Um, nearly nobody is working on x86 devices. There are a few, but I think it's boring. Um, the ARM devices were, uh, are what used to be there during the last years. And now with uh, RISC-V finally coming um, major enough that uh, you can do decent stuff well, you can run a full desktop on it. That's a um, really nice field. And um, they are in the industry also major factors or major, major drivers where I think it pushes these um, risk development. It's not only about, um, it's nice to have this um, simpler instruction set and this uh, more free idea about um, the licensing. Well, most of the CPUs are still uh, proprietary and you can, cannot get the schematics and build it yourself. But um, I think the main dri driver is mostly coming from um, the Eastern countries, Asia countries, where they are investing quite a lot in getting RISC-V in a similar state as, as ARM because of license and legal issues. And that's probably a reason why you see so much RISC-V development in China and around. Um, and at the moment, there are quite a lot of boards um, coming. Um, well, the Beagle 5 was ju just released. Um, I talked to a few guys at Embedded OSS two weeks ago. Um, they also said, we cannot talk about, but boards are coming with also better GPU. So there's a lot of uh, things happening. And it's cool that we are already running there. So it's, it's a nice, really nice platform area. However, the GPUs are the major pain point at the moment. It was the same with ARM, where we finally got the, um, for the Raspberry, the, the nice um, open source driver and also for other devices. Um, here, at least it's light on the horizon because for the uh, Beagle Play, which is the ARM board from before, there is a um, merge request for a Linux, open source Linux driver. The MISA support is already there. And I did not completely check, but I expect it to be uh, also portable um, to, uh, to the um, um, Beagle 5 board. I expect them to, to go also there because it's related, which will extremely help there. Some other trends um, that I wanted to, to mention here because that are um, not that well known, I think, in the desktop area to think about, uh, to tell a little bit about what um, in the embedded field are important topics at the moment. Um, I think the um, read-only file system, which um, sometimes is also discussed for desktops, where you say you will want to have an immutable 
system and only do major updates between the operating systems and then install everything with a container, with Flatpak or Snappy or whatever, um, is already there the main topic. And that's um, the main reason there is for complexity, um, or for complexity handling, because um, you want to get a defined set of, in of data, of applications, libraries, Linux kernel installed to, uh, installed to your board, because the next update, usually we are not standing next to it and can fix anything, you um, must make sure that it really works, it does not break the system. And that's really, really important topic there. Um, mostly um, telling us uh, containers are being an important topic here, which, what is currently quite um, tricky in Yocto, but uh, it will be an important topic in that area. Um, Another thing what you hear often, um, which is, well, it's a no-brainer for us, but in um, most of the embedded industry, uh, a lot of people are talking about uh, deprecating prop proprietary tools and saying, well, the open source tools are usually better. You see it, for example, with um, these AB mode updates. There's Rauk there, there's Mender there, which work extremely well and um, I didn't see any um, proprietary seller during the last few years because there's no market area anymore. Um, you also see that uh, with build systems. There were um, competitors for Yocto in uh, proprietary systems, but most are, well, they are deprecated or already obsolete. And that's really nice because you see that uh, the standard tools we want to use, we are using that are open, they are coming there also tools uh, known from desktop, uh, system init systems. Even in mail devices use systemd because it makes things easier. Um, the automotive grade Linux uh, deprecated their own mail tool going to systemd. It's, it's really nice to see what's happening there because it also means for us um, we are really close to, to embedded because they are using our tools today in some areas, <laughs> which is a little bit funny, but uh, it's nice. Um, another area where there's a lot of talk at the moment is um, security and safety. Um, I think safety was earlier, but uh, if you look at um, the main topics at embedded conferences, a lot of people are talking about making the uh, Linux kernel safe. What are concepts for, for working in a safe environment and not uh, hurting the people who are using the device? That's there. The important, more important topic for us is probably the security because we don't want to do anything with safety. We cannot do, there have to be concepts amount and that's fine, that will work. But security is always an issue if our software is some, on some devices. And I think also the packaging has to look at that, that we um, make it easy for CVEs to be, to be tracked, for example. And another point is multimedia complexity. So mostly the complexity we know from the desktop that is coming to, um, to embed it because, uh, well, if you have uh, a car with several audio systems or cameras around, it's, it's complex. It's really complex and tools like Pipewire coming uh, from people who did uh, automotive and it's also used on the desktop and it's similar from, from what we have. Um, looking a little bit at well, uh, getting started with embedded. Um, so, how to get people in, well, let's say KDE embedded system. Um, we started a little bit already at last FOSTEM. Um, we finally have, quite late, but we have a wiki page explaining how to start with embedded. Um, we made it even so simple that we have um, a really short instruction that you simply can follow to well, you can create a Docker container, you can um, use a repo to set everything up, you can run Yocto, wait for five to ten hours depending on your computer, and you have an image that you can flash. <laughs> um, yeah, you need a powerful computer, but it's easy to, to follow the first steps to get the first device running, and from there um, go further to, to test what you want to do. Since first time we, uh, well, we discovered that we didn't have a matrix channel, it's there and you can gladly join and ask questions. And if you um, are interested in anything, just join, 
all of us are friendly, and we are, uh, it's so simple to do new patches. We have tooling to, to use, we have low-hanging fruits, and there are a lot of devices that you can play around with. And yeah, really, if, if you want to start, it's, I did a small shopping list um, that I am planning still to uh, also to add to uh, the wiki with more details, but I uh, did a rough estimation what you need to do to, to start with that embedded stuff, because it's harder than on desktop stuff. On desktop, you have your de desktop computer you can work on. If you do want to do embedded, I think the minimum is that you need an SD card, because you need your software somewhere in your board. You need an I would always use a USB to serial converter, because if your kernel stacks, you want to have that. I didn't know it in the beginning, and it was an, this an investment of five euros, it was good. I have several now. Um, you need a card writer, and you need a dev board. Um, the boards I had there, I think the cheapest one is about 80. You can even all, use all the Raspberry Pis, but you should, if you want to use that, and go in that area, use one where proper Yocto support is there, and don't start from an arbitrary board with bad Yocto support and create everything from scratch. It's, it's a pain for starters. So Raspberry Pi is fine. Vision 5 is fine. Uh, Vision 5.2 is fine. Um, what I missed there is um, I expected that you have a spare uh, monitor around, because plus well, without a monitor is not that much fun. Um, you, all of these boards have HDMI, so that's then fine. And the starting point is our wiki page. It will be extended during this week. Um, but also a little bit more about um, embedded development. Um, that's maybe not clear to everybody um, how actually develop for embedded devices. Um, if you're a desktop developer, you're used to the workflow. You have your software. You compile it. You run it. You connect your debugger or your gamma ray or whatever and figure out what's broken. On, desktop, uh, on an embedded device, the main difference is you should do the same and afterwards go to the embedded device because um, the main pain for embedded development is deployment. So you develop something on your desktop, or you, let's say you want to develop on the device, compile everything on the device, you don't have that time for waiting for uh, low for a really um, slow board to compile everything. So you want to cross-compile on your system and flash it to your device. You want to have a good tool chain, but that's easy. Actually, there is um, already uh, supporting Yocto for uh, setting up Visual Studio. That was just merged uh, a week ago, I think. Um, for Qt Creator, I think it's also quite possible. However, there are also these um, scripts you can find in the uh, boot to Qt uh, repos and used to, to uh, set up your, um, the Qt creator automatically. But that's, that's easy that you can do cross compilation from your IDE to your board. But um, what I want to say is um, it's so much faster if you try to get your application in a decent stay on your desktop system and then port to the device because usually there's not that much difference. You will find small problems, but not the big problems. They, you will find them before. And so it's easier to, uh, to really figure out the tweaks, the, uh, the shaders that are extremely slow on a certain hardware, the weird crashes, but um, getting everything in the shape on the desktop, it's usually a good idea. Point um, that I am looking also in um, the next few months, um, we talked about Last Academy, and I think we now have really understand to, to do that easy, easy is um, to get a CI for all uh, Yocto layers. At the moment, I have my private CI where I have, uh, I think, five Yocto distributions on my system and just run them doing an update, but uh, it's so much easier if it's done automatically with a per merge request, and I think uh, with the restructuring did, we did during the last year, it's quite easy because we have the automatic setup of uh, Yocto systems. We have two to three line scripts that can start a full one. So it's can, I can even imagine that we um, introduce pre-merge um, builds. And so the question is then what to do next? And that I'm uh, really looking forward for input. Um, I think we really 
should look into uh, spreading our usage. Uh, that's a picture from the last FOSDEM. In front, you see, you can really barely see the uh, Vision 5.2 board. And it was, well, it's, it's not, was not crowded at that point, but it was usually a really crowded store there. Um, so I think we, which areas can we spread usage? Do you know somebody who is using KD frameworks, should use it? We, we have nice ways uh, to su support that. And yeah, new ideas come to me, come to the boss. And that's everything I prepared. Thank you. Thank you. I get to point out that if you are interested but don't have a developer board and don't have money, uh, KDE EV has a Star 5 Vision 5 V2 board available for use. So you can just get one. Questions from the room? So as you've put it, well, whoa. Um, like, it kind of feels like a toy. Like, on one end, you have all of the available things. Like, you can use any of the boards, but then, like, you flash it, and then you're done. And what happens next? Like, do we have plans for a system for updates or stuff like that? Um, I th think that's, yep. Yeah. That's a really good question, because it's about uh, what do we want to have. At the moment, um, I don't see that we have a KDE product in mind and say we prepare, let's say, a big screen box that we connect to a TV or doing the next Steam Deck ourselves or having a weather station. So um, I think that's all doable, but at the moment I see those um, things at specific people external who create something on top of us. But it's inevitable, right? Like as soon as we're successful, we're going to need it. Otherwise, it's going to remain a toy. Yeah, well, uh, at the moment, we are providing infrastructure to making such products. Like huge, cute, they don't, don't have their own product. They, uh, well, uh, the visual product that you have in your hands and say, that's the cute application. Uh, you have the frameworks to, to create something. At the moment, the embedded stuff I see in the, the uh, more the supporting area. But um, it's, I think, very easy to, uh, to make out of that a product, but um, that requires somebody or a few people who say, we want to do that product. We could say, Plasma Mobile, we want to create that as a flashable thing via our Yocto setup. It's not that hard if we figure out which hardware specifically. So at the moment, we have a tool and a, a framework. Uh, so I. Uh, I know that you have a demo image and uh, like there is a push for like making use of the KDE frameworks and other related parts on the embedded devices. So my question is like, do you have some success stories out of it? Like uh, some products made use of uh, KDE frameworks or Plasma or things like that. I mean like the Steam Deck is the one and also kind of like the Pine64 devices where Plasma Mobile was shipped. But do you have some success story of the Yocto? So I didn't get the last one. Uh, do you have some success story of the Yocto base being used in some products or things like that? Um, I am cur currently not sure who is exactly is, uh, using our Yocto layers in products. I know that's not the Steam Deck. They are doing it differently. Um, I know about um, out automotive where Yocto layers are at least used, but not in final products, as far as I know. But that's the bad side. We, it's, it's hard to figure out. Other questions from the room? Uh, not from Aleish. <laughs> <laughs> Aleish? Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, is it as bad with Risk V as it is with ARM that you need to, like, do have like very separate different builds for any board? Um, I wouldn't say that's that bad, because uh, you, if you know a specific hardware, you can optimize to make it fast on that hardware. So it's not general purpose. Well, you, you could, 
I'm, I'm not, not sure if there's any um, well, general bootloader that supports arbitrary ARM board, uh, uh, risk five boards. Um, but actually, when looking with the, my Yocto glasses on that, I actually don't care. Because um, when I'm building a Yocto image, I know my target platform, my target system, and I build for that. Um, and it's really easy to, um, to do it for several boards, different images. At one point, it will get a scalability issue, for sure. But um, usually, people are looking here at uh, getting a restricted uh, variety of hardware to support. Sometimes it's easy to, um, it's possible to, to support different um, U-boot loaders or U-boot configurations and makes that work. Um, I'm not really sure how, uh, how far is it with the uh, general, well, hardware detection at the boot time. But at the moment, I think it's similar to ARM. Yeah, if I may add to that, it's similar to ARM in that uh, an image that will boot on a Star 5 Vision 5 V2 won't boot on a Star 64, which is the Pine Risk 5 board. Uh, they have the same CPU, they have the same peripherals, they've got everything looks the same on the spec sheet. It doesn't work. So it's the same kind of nasty situation. That can be fixed. That's why there's a boff, right? At one point, uh, contributing to that is that um, there are still a lot of uh, kernel patches to be upstreamed. Vision 5 is, um, Vision 5.2 is on a really good track, as I, I see. They have a lot of things uh, just being integrated in kernel 6.5, and there are a lot of pending patches for 6.6. So it's closing. I think uh, for U-Boot, uh, there are only three patches left. They're already merged, but the U-Boot, it's really close. But um, it, for new hardware, it always takes time to, to get them fully supported. And then the question is about um, arbitrary booting. I expect it to be there at some time. Let's see. Neither of the boards will run FreeBSD yet. <laughs> That's a threat, yes. And otherwise, it is time to applaud loudly. Thank you. That's it for today. You can go home now. <laughs>